So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on digital inclusion and libraries in North America, prospects and challenges. My name is Nafiz Zaman Shubo, and I'm an assistant professor at Queens College, City University of New York, and an elected member of uh, the IFLA North American Regional Division. I'll be moderating today's webinar. The webinar is organized by the IFLA North American Regional Division. If you're interested in learning more about the division, please check the link I just added to the chat box. I've also added the link to a, a Padlet that, that contains the brief biographies of our panelists. So feel free to check those uh, links. We are very fortunate to have six panelists for our today's webinar. We'll be presenting on four different library digital inclusion projects or initiatives in North America. I'm joined by Mark Williams, Chief Librarian and CEO, Milton Public Library, and he'll be presenting on virtual reality with seniors, its use for preventing isolation and further decline into Alzheimer's. Then um, Safida McKenzie, project, uh, project leader, Bridge Project, Toronto Public Library, and Joseph Lalonde, Manager Data and Analytics, Toronto Public Library, and Sean Mitchell, uh, Director of Policy and Planning and Performance Management, Toronto Public Library. They will be presenting on uh, the driving digital inclusion and data informed decisions, Bridge Technology Assessment Tool, Toronto Public Library. And then we'll have presentation by uh, Julie Walker. She is the State Librarian and Associate Vice Chancellor for Libraries, Georgia Public Library Service. Uh, our presentation title is Seizing the Moment, Digital Equity and Inclusion in Georgia. And then finally, final presentation will be by Sonia Alcantara Antoine. She is the CEO Baltimore uh, County Public Library. And the presentation title is The Journey Towards Digital Equity and Inclusion in Baltimore County, Maryland. So before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted on IFLA YouTube and other channels. So we'll be sharing with, uh, sh sharing with everyone uh, in about one to two weeks, the recording will be available. And then uh, each digital inclusion project will get 10 minutes for the presentations and we'll hold the Q&A until the end of the session. So every, at that time, everyone can use the chat feature to ask questions or unmute and uh, ask your questions. So I think uh, we'll, uh, I would like to welcome Mark Williams uh, for the presentation. Thank you. You are muted. Thanks, Nafis. Um, can you actually see my screen? I've just shared it. Not nope. yet. Let me try again. Yeah. It's always great when technology does what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. Excellent. Let me begin the. Okay. Okay, well, um, thank you, Nafiz, and to IFLA for asking me to give an overview of the virtual reality program that we've implemented at Milton Public Library. Um, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm actually randomly sitting looking out over the San Francisco Bay because I've been at an Internet Archive conference all week, so um, I'm presenting to you from San Francisco and not actually from Milton. So I'm incredibly fortunate and lucky to do that. But Thank you again, um, and I'm just going to give you a brief overview of our virtual reality program for seniors. So going back to September 2017, uh, I read an article in the Public Library's online um, platform around the benefits of 
virtual re reality for people or for seniors, um, and particularly seniors with mobility issues and those that are homebound, right? So the article went on to feature an article in Wired magazine that was specifically around the Better with Age program. And better had been um, spelled so that the final E was replaced with a V because the Better with Age program was a project, and I think it's still going, that developed content to allow homebound seniors to actively participate through virtual reality in activities that meant something to them before they were homebound, right? So specifically, they focused on a guy that had um, originally been from the UK, had moved to the States, had been an actor throughout his life and had worked on the London stage and then ultimately the New York stage. And because he was homebound, he was lamenting the fact that he wasn't able to visit um, any of these theatrical performances. And so the Better With Age program developed content that was ultimately recording theatrical performances from both the London and the New York stage. And then it, it focused on the impact that that had for him specifically, right? So that was the focus of the Better With Age program. That was certainly the focus of the Wired Magazine article. But then what, what was even more interesting is that the Public Libraries article went on to talk about the burgeoning uh, research that around the potential for virtual reality to help offset further cognitive impairment and, and specifically further decline into Alzheimer's for those that were um, experiencing Alzheimer's symptoms, if you like. So of course in 2017, it was that research was in its infancy, but you jump forward to today, and there has been no end of research, largely stemming from the UK academic and scientific community that sort of reaffirms the fact that virtual reality does actually offset further cognitive impairment and specifically further decline into Alzheimer's. But more broadly than that, um, those, those same researchers have, have determined that virtual reality is the best determiner of Alzheimer's in that it diagnoses it better than any other form of cognitive cognitive test that's available, right? So, so the, the, the potential for virtual reality and um, its benefits to Alzheimer's are, are immense, right? So, so from a, an academic and a scientific perspective, that, that initial investment that we made in the virtual reality program has sort of proven dividends, but that's almost um, secondary to the local benefits that we've experienced since investing in the headsets that we purchased back in 2017, right? So thinking about that Wired magazine article, they referenced a startup uh, called Rendeva, who were also in their infancy, and Rendeva's purpose is really to work or to de develop content for virtual reality to work specifically with seniors. So we reached out to them. We were incredibly fortunate to receive a, a provincial grant to allow us to purchase uh, the headsets and to develop a partnership with a yet to be determined uh, company that ended up being Rendeva, right? And, and Rendeva have now gone from strength to strength. And if you, if you look for them online, you can see that they're now an international company because the, or their reach is international because the impact of what they do is so significant, right? So, you know, we're, we're proud of the fact that we were one of the early adopters of that, but we're proud of that because of the impact that it's had on the seniors communities that we work with, right? So thinking about Milton specifically, we've got three senior residential homes. We're a population in total of around 150,000 and are Canada's, one of Canada's fastest growing. So that population is, is set to double in the next 10 years. We're um, an, in, uh, an incredibly diverse populace in that um, almost 50% of the population are from a racialized minority. And we have an increasingly aging population. So we wanted to make sure that the needs of the homebound seniors, and specifically those homebound seniors in the residential homes, were being met through virtual reality, specifically around that um, mobility and the potential for then supporting anyone that was experiencing Al Alzheimer's from, um, you know, not descending into further Alzheimer's, I guess. So, um, 
the librarian that you see in that picture with one of the residents of one of their care homes, Anna, um, she was charged with building relationships with each of the care homes in order that we could go in and work with anyone that was interested in participating in the program. So we originally purchased uh, one tablet and the 10 corresponding headsets. Um, and Anna and the staff at each of the care homes sounded out each of the um, participants to see what their level of interest was. And, and from that early interaction, it, it went from strength to strength in that, you know, no end of participants wanted to take part in the program. And the way that it works is that uh, Anna will uh, determine what content the participants want to watch if you like and then she controls that through the tablets so that each of the 10 participants watch the same content um, and of course you know when we started the program in september actually we launched it in march 2018 of course we had a, a good couple of years where um there was it was just going from strength to strength and we were purchasing more content and and developing more of that um collaborative participation in terms of deciding what it was that we were going to show based on what the uh, seniors were asking us for. And then of course the pandemic hits, right? So so then the social isolation or the, the benefits of virtual reality through, uh, you know, eliminating social, social isolation really came into the fore during the pandemic, if you like, because what we then did, because Anna was not able to go and visit the care homes any longer. And because each of the care home residents were certainly in Ontario were confined to their, um, their rooms for a period of time, we then asked the care home coordinators if they were interested in actually undertaking the function that Anna had undertaken so that we trained their um, coordinators to actually do what Anna had been doing, which was to control the content and, and use the tablet to then allow each of those residents in each of the rooms to act actively participate in the programme, even though they were confined to their room. So, so it maintained some level of social interaction at a point in time where that so social isolation had some real potential for, and, you know, the, the the complete opposite of what we were trying to in that in in that it would you know help exacerbate um alzheimer's or so, social isolation if you like so so ultimately during the pandemic we purchased an additional tablet we purchased an additional 10 handsets so the two care homes that did that took us up on that offer were then able to have their own headsets and their own tablet and to work with um, their residents uh, during a period of time that, that, that was um, horrible for everyone, but particularly those um, seniors living in residences, certainly within Ontario at least. So, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we're now at a point in time where I think people are craving that actual interaction. And so the, the uptake of um, virtual reality program is sort of dwindled, but we're now looking to go back and, and build on that. And we're, we're looking to develop uh, Milton specific content with Rendever in order that, um, you know, some of the people that are Milton natives or Mil Milton locals can actually benefit from Milton specific content, which doesn't actually exist at the moment. So in a nutshell, that's our virtual reality program. That's how we're trying to um, help elim eliminate or reduce so social isolation. And, and in doing so, hopefully, supporting efforts to um, reduce further decline into Alzheimer's. So hopefully that gives you what you want. If it doesn't, I'm sorry. Excellent, yeah. It's very interesting and very, very, very timely digital inclusion project. Thank you so much, Mark. I was not aware of this one before. So next uh, we have Safida. Thank you, and her team. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so thank you for inviting TPL to speak to you today about the Bridge Project. 
So I want to start off with some introductions, as you heard from the piece. Um, I am the project leader of the project, and I have with us today on hand in the back end, uh, Joseph Lalonde, our manager in data analytics, and Sean Mitchell, our director, who's a member of the IFLA North American Regional Division Committee. So today I've broken up the presentation into four sections. We're gonna start with a broad overview and background, then a detailed look at the tool toolkit itself, followed by most recent preliminary data from the TPL Bridge Patron Survey, and lastly conclude with our vision for the project. So the Bridge Project is an initiative that helps public libraries in Ontario assess the impact of technology services offered. It supports libraries to expand the reach of technology services that they deliver to their communities and enable libraries to understand and demonstrate how technology service directly benefits residents, particularly the most marginalized and highest need customers. TPL takes a leadership role in this project, working closely with small and medium libraries across Ontario to equip them with the fluency to understand and leverage data in the public library sector. So this is a timeline that gives you a brief history of the project. In 2016, Bridge Technology Service Assessment Toolkit, which we just refer to as Bridge Toolkit, was born, led by TPL and designed to support public libraries across the province in the provision of technology services. Bridge was tested and refined through two pilots. Results from the pilot study were published in August, 2018. The second phase of the project included a larger group of library systems, and we established our partnership with ULC to launch Edge in Canada for the first time. Results from the beta phase were published in September 2020. Then COVID hit, and we turned off the lights for a short period of time as libraries were completely closed early on in the pandemic. In May 2021, we relaunched and faced an exceptional challenge of re-recruiting libraries after a period of complete disconnect and in a very uncertain future. It was challenging to gain participation with the strain of staffing, funding, and capacity limits across Ontario. By cementing the importance more now than ever for evidence-based advocacy, we were successful in gaining 50 participating libraries. This phase was different in that we had two streams. The new data fluency stream was created as a result of direct feedback from our foundational knowledge on leveraging data in the public library sector. Since that time, we worked hard to maintain consistent and long-term use of the toolkit. We further adapted our program offerings in March, 2022, moving away from phases and streams, allowing libraries the flexibility to join two peer learning cohorts requirements with implications for funding, benchmarking, and evaluation. To date, we have 31 participating libraries of various sizes from various regions in Ontario currently using the toolkit on a consistent and ongoing basis. Foundational to how Bridge works is understanding the Bridge outcome framework. The framework developed is three-tiered. It suggests that digital inclusion and digital literacy are the primary outcomes of technology services offered by public libraries. These outcomes in turn enable a range of secondary outcomes. Key performance indicators are data points that are used to measure public libraries contribution to the primary and secondary outcomes. Together, these two primary, four secondary outcomes and 11 key performance indicators create a framework to measure and benchmark how technology access in public libraries improves the lives of residences across Ontario while advancing the broader impact of government strategies and programs. Let's take a deeper dive into the three bridge components that make up this advanced toolkit. Bridge drills down further than the usual attendance stats to show outcomes that point to a changing condition. It provides data through our three bridge components that demonstrate that programs and services at the library change lives that they go beyond just access to technology, but build digital inclusion and literacy that allows people to improve their lot in life. This supplements the wonderful anecdotes and stories that Bridge also collects, all in one convenient platform with easy to use one-click reporting features that reduce the portfolio of work for library leaders. 
here's the robust list of standard technology that Bridge can measure. It's meant to be exhaustive. It's certainly not indicative of what most libraries in Ontario offer. Libraries have the flexibility to customize their dashboard and surveys by adding and removing technology based on their current service offerings. Additionally, what you are seeing here is Bridge demographic data collection, which contributes to equity and inclusion attributes. We ask voluntary demographic questions so that we have a better understanding of library users and how they use technology services in order to identify gaps and reduce barriers. Understanding the unique makeup of our city is an important part of improving our services. So what do Bridge Toolkit results look like? Here are some very preliminary findings for TPL specifically. We had a total of 9,447 survey responses in this 12 month period and over 1,228 customer feedback comments. The findings suggest libraries bridge inequities to technology access for those who do not have alternate means and further outcomes show Libraries support digital literacy by increasing digital comfort as a result of this access. Substantial internet use at the library demonstrates public libraries role in bridging the digital divide. Libraries also foster a supportive environment for patrons to learn how to use new technologies. And further outcomes show libraries build digital literacy with continued use as a result of this access. The findings suggest even with the shift to digital, libraries contribute to significant increased levels of community and social engagement by providing welcoming and inclusive spaces for people to access and use technology. Libraries also connect people, especially vulnerable populations with essential government information and resources. Lastly, the findings suggest libraries facilitate access to education and lifelong learning, including support for those in school or at the beginning of their career. They support workforce development by enabling the development of employable skills and provide resources to support the various stages of job search process, career transitions, and reskilling that result in further outcomes, such as success finding a job. So that concludes preliminary key findings from 2021 2022 these preliminary results already have implications for advocacy and potential future funding it helps tell a meaningful story that resonates with our stakeholders decision makers and local leaders and reminds them of the vital role libraries play in our communities just as importantly it out allows us to assess our digital literacy impact and will affirm whether what we're doing is working I wanna close the presentation by sharing the vision for the project. The project allows public libraries to measure the progress towards these outcomes and allows libraries collective capacity to deliver on the shared vision of digital inclusion and digital literacy for all Ontarians. We also value the feedback we get from participating Ontario libraries that demonstrate the importance of collective advocacy most importantly, giving small rural libraries that face many staffing and funding constraints a fighting chance at demonstrating their value to stakeholders, funders, and the general public. I'd like to acknowledge all of our participating libraries throughout the years, our partners, and the Government of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, I have some questions, but it, it, it depends on whether we have time at the end of the presentation. So next, uh, we're moving from presentation from Canada to the US. And first presentation is by Julie Walker. Thank you so much, Julie. Okay, one moment, please. We can see now, thanks. You can see now? Great, thank you so much. Um, 
I am really pleased to be here today and appreciate the opportunity to talk about digital inclusion from a statewide perspective in the largest state east of Mississippi River uh, with broad diversity and communities of every size and shape with widely varying resources. From Atlanta to rural Southwest Georgia, we have 410 public libraries serving communities. And my agency is the Georgia Public Library Service, the State Library Agency. Our philosophy at GPLS has always been to distribute resources to ensure that all of our libraries can be included in the programs and services, not just those who can afford the top shelf. Large, small, urban, rural, even one on an island only accessible by boat. All of our libraries and all of their patrons deserve inclusion in equitable and affordable connectivity. We're keenly aware of the disparity in resources and expertise, so we keep that in mind always as we're designing our initiatives. Collaboration has been key to many of the programs that, that we've designed. An early example of this you may be familiar with is our Pines Statewide Library Card. We formed a statewide consortium in anticipation of Y2K to assist our less resource libraries with automation. Then in 1995, we moved Pines from a vendor-based ILS to um, our open source um, solution that we developed in-house, Evergreen developed specifically for a large consortium. And this has allowed us to provide a statewide state-of-the-art ILS, which is particularly valuable to those who couldn't otherwise afford the product and support. Pines is managed by our agency, freeing up local dollars that would otherwise be required for vendor services, system administration, hardware, software that they could not afford. Um, Georgians through the Pines network have access to over 11 million items owned by the Pines member libraries delivered by a state run and state funded courier service to the patrons home library. Moving our agency and our public libraries to Google Suites has also provided significant cost savings while streamlining operations. This was really a leap of faith by our libraries, leaving some well-known products that they were accustomed to. Um, but we've spent years working closely with our library's leadership to ensure transparency and collaboration and decision-making so that we're moving everyone forward together. I'm excited to mention our tech boot camp because the 2022 version is just coming up in a couple of weeks. We bring IT staff, library directors, and subject experts together for three days of programming, networking, hands-on activities with new technology, gaming, and a lot of late night bonding. Um, because we're aware of the varying levels of expertise in libraries, particularly in the IT space, um, what they can afford in tech support is all over the map. So providing the time and space for these folks to get to know us and each other, to build a network of resources they can call on throughout the year is so valuable. It's important to ensure that all of our libraries have someone with basic hardware and software troubleshooting skills and the confidence to ensure that things run smoothly at their libraries. We can't just send them equipment, which is, has been easy to do with the recent influx of cash from the federal government, but we have to invest not just in the infrastructure and devices, but in the ongoing support systems. We also talk a lot about information security at this conference because libraries need to protect personal information and privacy. And most of our libraries don't have that particular expertise on staff. So we prioritized creating an InfoSec position at uh, GPLS to protect both our agency and the libraries. We also provide filtered DNS and risk assessments. We've, we've all heard before that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So the COVID pandemic was most certainly a crisis and it clearly exposed the critical need for connectivity across America and the disparity in access. We've been fortunate in Georgia that even before COVID, our state general assembly recognized the importance of libraries and the need to continually support and upgrade library technology. Each year they allocate bond funding specifically for library technology enhancements. We're aware that in many Georgia counties, the public library is the only place offering broadband for folks trying to accomplish work, complete school assignments and stay connected. So we try to offer maximum flexibility in spending these funds, as we know that our 410 libraries have very different technology needs. We created the uh, LibTech grants, uh, as you see on this slide, um, to ensure that each library system can purchase the items it needs and we negotiate group pricing for the most popular items to ensure that the money stretches as far as possible. 
the federal funding that has been flowing and continues to flow to state and local governments to address some of these issues is very timely and important. Um, and I'm very aware that many of our organizations are somewhat overwhelmed by this sudden influx and the accompanying deadlines. As our libraries cope with staffing shortages, expectations of new and different service models, and a host of other demands, we see our role at the State Library as key to ensuring that we seize this moment and use all available resources uh, to increase access across Georgia and ensure that libraries are playing the vital roles that we need to play. Our Libraries Without Walls grant were created with CARES Act funding with, with the five focus areas here, broadband, Chromebook lending, which became incredibly important as so many students at all levels of educational pursuits um, were sometimes trying to uh, complete courses on their phones. So um, we've worked very hard to get lots of Chromebooks out in circulation along with Wi-Fi hotspots. The G Suite migration that I mentioned, we were already underway with that, um, realizing cost savings, but we were happy to speed that along. Uh, tech innovation grants and Wi-Fi expansion. Then when, with ARPA grants, we expanded on our Libraries Without Walls program to include digital inclusion, eBooks and technology, more and more device lending. And that hasn't just been a COVID thing. Just last week, I had three university students contact me to say that they were struggling to complete their semester using their smartphones and we got laptops into their hands. Um, these these um, ARPA relief grants have also supported digitization, audiobooks, uh, replacing and improving and upgrading equipment. And our goal was to support our libraries as they transition to a more hybrid model of in-person and virtual services. And a lot of our libraries chose to purchase vehicles, like you see on this slide, um, as they continue to do more community outreach and more outdoor activities. By the end of March 2022, 139 projects were funded uh, at about uh, one and a quarter million dollars, um, having already been spent. We love our tech loaner kit program, and we've been doing that for a long time already, but we've been able to expand those. Our original kits were a mix of tech and STEAM items, 3D printers, virtual reality, and a virtual reality field trip kit, uh, which was very popular. We have added uh, a telescope kit, a cybersecurity penetration testing kit, drone kits, a Wi-Fi expansion kit, which includes Wi-Fi tools for analyzing available spectrum and testing long range mesh formats and allows libraries to see what methods will work best for their area based on spectrum congestion, line of sight availability and distance. Uh, we've created an Oculus kit and wonderful live streaming kits with equipment needed for recording, live streaming, and podcasting. So all of those are terribly popular. We check those out for the libraries. They can keep them for several weeks to do programming in their communities and decide what they might want to purchase on their own. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say we've learned it's really important for us to stay in touch with our stakeholders our people on the front lines to find out what they really want and need. We can't at the state assume we know what's needed in all of our diverse communities. They're the ones that are in touch with, with the people out in their communities and with their local government officials. Um, we can't ever forget that the foundational service that makes everything possible is that broadband and our E-rate team and GPLS assists every K through 12 school district and every public library in the state in applying for E-rate. This year, we're adding support for our juvenile justice institutions as well. And in Georgia, internet at public libraries is 100% covered. We at the state pay for the non-E-rated portion um, of internet service and broadband service for all of our public libraries. We're creating a new IT outreach position to assist libraries in identifying and applying for yet more grants and other funding. And we believe that the role of the state library in every state is vital in these efforts. We have a deep reach into our state and comprehensive knowledge of our libraries. It's our job to make their jobs easier and to enhance their offerings. We also play an important role in advocacy. We work to frame the conversation in ways that appeals to funders. What do they want? What are their priorities? And how do we help with that? So we, we continue to advocate for all kinds of funding for this important work in digital inclusion all across Georgia and similar work is going on in lots of other states. Thanks so much. Wow, excellent. Thank you so much. 
one of the uh, from the last three presentation it is it is clear that so much is happening in libraries in North America in the areas of digital inclusion and uh, that many of us probably do, do not know. So I'll probably take this uh, this presentation, we'll organize this presentation not only just for the LIS professionals, but outside of uh, libraries and to, to highlight how libraries are really playing an important role in the areas of uh, digital inclusion. Thank you, Julie. And now uh, we have our last presentation but not the list, uh, by Sonia. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sonia Alcantara Antoine. Uh, let me share my screen. I hope you guys can see that. So my name again is Sonia Alcantara Antoine. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Baltimore County Public Library. I'm also the President-Elect for the Public Library Association. Um, a little bit about me, I'm relatively new to my role here at BCPL. I've been here for um, about a year and a half now. And I wanna share with you kind of our journey towards digital equity um, here in Baltimore County. Um, here is the state of Maryland uh, in the Eastern, on the East Coast of the United States. And uh, highlighted in blue is Baltimore County. Uh, we are one of 24 public library systems in the state. Baltimore County Public Library is one of the largest uh, library systems in the state. Um, and I wanna share a little context with you about how we got to where we are, because again, this is a journey and you can't know where you're going unless you know where you came from. So um, a big thing that happened to us um, in 2014, uh, so almost 10 years ago, was that Baltimore County centralized IT and they absorbed Baltimore County Public Library's IT into the county's overall IT. And this is unusual because we are the only uh, public library in the state of Maryland that is not in control of our own IT. Um, and it remains that way still. Um, and there are advantages to disadvantages to that. Um, but what, one thing that's really good about it is that it allows us to focus on the thing that we're good at, which is community and access. And it allows OIT to focus on the things that they're good at, which is networking and cybersecurity. So we can focus on our strengths and what's in our appropriate wheelhouse. Um, we are a great partner with OIT and vice versa. They use us a lot to provide information on access because we have a finger on the pulse of the community and we interact with the community in ways that OIT does not. So that's been very beneficial for our partnership. Another thing that happened over the past 10 years is that when um, the county centralized IT, we were left in a position of, well, we're not in charge of IT anymore. So what do we do? What's gonna be our focus? And so we turned our focus to emerging technology. So um, it, it, we almost focused exclusively, almost entirely on emerging technology, um, partly because that's, that was the thing that OIT was not doing. So we were like, well, that's gonna be our lane. That's what we're gonna do. That's where we're gonna shine. But also because there was the novelty aspect of it. You know, So we, were, we, were, we would say, oh, we have 3D printers and oh, we have this and oh, we have that. And it was a lot of shiny new things that got us attention, but the outcomes really weren't there. And so we, over the past 10 years, we've really had to struggle to find that balance, right? Emerging technology is great and public libraries absolutely have an essential role to providing exposure to and access to emerging technology, but it has to be balanced with addressing the real needs of the community. Yeah, it might be great that you have that 3D printer or you have that drone or what have you in your library system, but is that what's gonna help people get a job? Is that what's gonna help somebody graduate from high school? And so shifting our attention a little bit over the past 10 years to how do we achieve those outcomes has been really important. I think the other thing that happened to us over the uh, recent past, which is what happened to every library everywhere is the pandemic, right? Uh, the pandemic laid bare all of our inequities in our, in, our society, in our society, in our communities, digital equity being among them. And the focus really shifted to, okay, how do we meet people where they are? How do we marshal and leverage all of our resources to really have an impact in our communities? And what exactly does that look like? Baltimore County is, um, when you look at the numbers, Baltimore County is considered to be one of the wealthier counties in Maryland. And there is this false narrative uh, within the county, but also within the state that we're rich, we're affluent, we got it going on, 
we don't have any problems. And that's false. Um, we do have homelessness. We do have poverty. We do have significant inequities across our community, just like anybody else. And so that false narrative really got in the way of us staring at problems in the face and, and addressing them directly. So all of these things kind of have been happening and simmering in the background over the 10 years that got us to the point of where we are today. So today at BCPL, uh, we are really hyper-focused on serving our community with an equity lens and being an anti-racist society that centers diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as it relates to technology, you can't talk about anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion over here on one side and not also talk about digital equity and digital inequity. Usually they are interrelated and digital equity typically falls along the same racial and demographic lines that you see in other types of inequities and other, and other things. Um, and, and the conversation for us, again, as we were talking about inequities in our community as it relates to digital inequity, it's about who has access and who doesn't and what are the implications of that and who gets left behind and who doesn't get, have, get to be a full participant in their local economy who doesn't get the opportunity to achieve their full potential because of lack of digital access and lack of uh, digital inclusion. One of the things that we did here at BCPL is that we renamed our technology department. It used to be called virtual and media services, but we changed the name to digital equity and virtual services. And it may not seem like a big deal, but words really matter and what you call things really matter. And so that shifted the focus of this department, which had exclusively been emerging technology to digital equity and framing that right there front and center in everything that they did. And for us, digital equity um, means more than I'm just gonna give you a computer or I'm gonna give you internet access. It's about making sure that people have access to internet like everyone else. So for example, I'm very fortunate, I'm very privileged. When I go home, I have, high-speed internet, I have multiple devices. If I wanna get onto the internet at three o'clock on a Sunday morning, I can do it. But what typically for so long in libraries, the narrative has been, if you are poor, or if you, are, if you live in a rural area, or if you are a member of a marginalized community and you need internet access and you need a PC, well, guess what? You can get one at the library, but the library is only open 50 hours a week. And that's what you get. And if you're lucky, if you need a computer in the middle of the night, if you need internet access in the middle of the night, you can sit in the parking lot of the library in the middle of the night and that's, that's what you get. And I don't really feel like that's good enough. Um, I feel like the library is a great safety net and it's a great plan B for when there's nothing, but that can't be all that there is. And so our focus is about how do we go beyond the traditional narrative? I also think that digital equity means that if you need to access um, internet or technology via your, your library, it, it can't be clunky or inconvenient um, using clunky and outdated and difficult to use systems. I've never worked at a public library that had great technology systems, quite frankly. And that's kind of par for the cost in, in public libraries. And I feel like that has to change. To me, that's not digital equity, that's the opposite of it. So that's kind of where we are at BCPL. Um, thinking about some of the things that we've been focusing on, particularly as we're shifting towards digital equity and, and what that looks like in our community is we've really strengthened our partnership with Baltimore County Office of Internet Technology. And for us here, um, it's very much looking at our entire community. Oftentimes when people frame digital uh, equity and digital inequity, it, it usually, becomes a conversation about rural communities uh, where there's a lack of infrastructure, there's a lack of uh, last mile connections, um, people don't have access to the internet utility. And for us here in Baltimore County, it's equally a rural issue as it is an urban issue. There's parts of Baltimore County that are very rural where they literally do not have the infrastructure, but there's other parts of Baltimore County where the infrastructure is there, but people can't afford it. So we try to address all parts of our community uh, with different approaches. Um, so uh, 
uh, OIT has been very, working very proactively to try to address the connectivity issue with the most rural parts of our county. And we are not in charge of that. Um, we're a public library system. We don't have the ability to build internet connections. However, we do have a seat at the table and we do have a lot of influence in those conversations. Again, because we have those connections with our community and we have those insights that OIT may not have. Um, the other thing that we focus on as part of our collaboration with the county is um, access and affordability, which we do have a lot of experience in, um, and literacy, which is something that libraries are uniquely able to address. Um, Baltimore County was named as one of 32 digital inclusion trailblazers by the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Again, because I think we have such a strong and forward thinking uh, partnership that is a model for others in the country. We're focused again on uh, here at BCPL primarily on access uh, and digital literacy. Um, we focus on um, providing laptops and hotspots. And over the past year, we have increased the amount of uh, hotspots that we have available to the community. We are in the process of piloting circulation of LTE Chromebooks, which are internet devices um, and laptops all in one package. You, you check one out and it gives you, it automatically has internet access uh, embedded in it. Um, we're also seeking grant funding to have devices that we can check out and loan to people for longer than the standard three weeks. So we're thinking months, possibly a year. Um, and we're also actively involved in distributing free Chromebooks, 14,000 Chromebooks um, that is coming from the state. Um, so we're, we're very active in all of that. And we've also been a hub for signing people up for the Affordable Connectivity Program, um, which is assistance provided by the federal government that gives a discount on, on internet um, that's, that, that people can have. Uh, we've also been focused on digital literacy. Um, we are a pilot. Uh, there's a state pilot going on and we are part of that pilot for offering North Star Digital Literacy, which is an online learning platform. Um, but we're also really, really rethinking a lot of what we offer um, because we do have a lot of online um, learning available. And then we also offer in-person learning. And it's really thinking, taking kind of peeling the layers back a little bit and asking ourselves, what are the hard skills that people need help with? And how do we meet people where we are? Lastly, one of the things that we're focused on at BCPL is on addressing digital inequity amongst staff. You cannot address digital inequity in your community when you, if you have not addressed digital inequity amongst staff. Really basic things like making sure all of your staff have enough computers and laptops to be able to do their work, making sure that they have the skills that they need to be able to, to use those devices. They can't if they don't have the tools that they need, if they don't have the knowledge that they need, then they are not really in a position to help you eradicate digital inequity uh, in your community. So that's where we are. Um, it's definitely a journey here. It's not a checklist where you one and done and you, you, know, you check something off your checklist and then you move on to something else. It's, it requires constant investment, constant analysis, you know, uh, going back to the drawing board sometimes and starting from scratch or building on uh, past successes. But uh, we're just really proud of the work that we're doing. We're proud of where we are right now, but also proud of and excited about the future and what's coming around the bend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the wonderful, wonderful presentation and bringing some critical thoughts into the table that those especially working in the areas of digital inclusion and libraries, we have to, we, we have a lot of lot to think about in terms of naming and uh, in terms of digital equity uh, for our staff. So we already have we received one question for uh, from Beth, and we have about eight minutes. So um, the question is about. For those libraries that loan technology equipment to patrons, are you assisting fines for those who are late to return the devices and or for those who do not return the devices at all? We know there are equity issues inherent in fines and fees, but also a sunk time and lost investment 
when a device is not returned that could cause a loan program to end if it is not sustainable so um whoever wants to respond to that question first i will jump I can in. jump no okay. yes. hi joy <laughs> thank you i'll just jump in for georgia to say that that our libraries individually determine their policies on fines so it's definitely not something that's consistent across the state during the pandemic a lot of our libraries didn't charge stop charging fines for a period of time and i'm fairly sure most of them didn't charge any fines on the equipment and we've had a remarkable rate of return we, we really have not struggled with the machines being damaged or lost or not returned at all but each library because that that funding is primarily local then it is a local decision on whether they charge fines or replacement costs for it Excellent. Sonia? And for us at Baltimore County Public Library, um, we went fine free um, a year ago, a little over a year ago, actually, uh, because of the inequities that that was causing. It, uh, the late fines were just really catastrophic um, for the people who, who needed libraries the most. Um, and so, you know, at the same time that we were having a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we were having that same conversation about fines and the negative impact that they were having on people in our community. So we do not charge late fines, um, even for technology. Um, and our approach has been, um, instead of um, worrying about fines and make, you know, worrying about whether or not people are going to return things on time, it's about, okay, maybe we just need to add more devices. And if necessary, do we get funding so that we can buy more devices so that there's more devices available for people um, and or people can keep them for longer periods of time. So that, that's kind of been where our area focuses. Um, and after a year of being fine free, we really have not seen any indication of people misusing uh, the library or abusing our resources and keeping them out longer or not returning them. Um, quite the opposite. People are actually more responsible. Wow. Sonia, I applaud that so much. I think it's so important and I agree with everything you said. Several of our library systems in Georgia are moving to fines free. I would love to see the entire state get there one day very soon, but good, good on you all for, for getting that done. Excellent. Any, any comments from the Canadian side? Um, from Milton Public Library's perspective, um, we haven't officially gone fine free yet because we, we operate in a fiscally conservative town, but um, there are ways that we've managed to circumvent some of that. I won't go into too many details in case any of my board are watching, but ultimately the staff have been empowered to use their discretion to waive fines in any instance, and we're actively encouraging them to continue to do that. So um, the, what we're trying to do is achieve an outcome where the revenue that the uh, municipality deems important from the fines is limited to such an extent that they they see uh, that it's a logical next step just to eliminate those fines completely. So it's a work in progress for us. But what I will say is that we have lots of high value items that we loan out, including gaming equipment and um, laptops that we lend to patrons. And we've not seen any significant um, reduction in the return on those items because i just think that there's um you know when you place a trust in your patrons that trust is 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 returned and and so i think if we're true to our mandate to support the needs of the most vulnerable within our community we we, we should continue down the path of ensuring that they have um access to the resources that they need and so i don't think that you know the potential for returning i not returning items should be seen as as an opportunity to to not go down the path of ensuring that the people that need access to the things that we're able to provide that we don't actually do it so that's the philosophy that informs Milton public library at least thank you so much yeah i would just add that uh, toronto public library also went fines free uh last year so it was a bit of a journey for us we started with children the year before and move to adult uh, the, the following year. So we're now completely fines free um, and follow the same sentiments that was shared with everyone else. Thank, thank you so much. So we have another question. It's, it's about 
is digital inclusion an interchangeable term with digital divide? What are your recommended synonyms currently available? I think that I'll speak a little bit, it's just especially with Bridge, Thanks. we really do focus on digital inclusion. But I think digital inclusion is the ideal. That's the outcome we want to get to by breaking the digital divide, right? So digital divide is the process, right? And we want to get to digital inclusion, ideally. I would add that I think it's important to um, not get so caught up on the words um, because sometimes depending on who you're talking to, you may need to change the words a little bit in a way that they will understand or resonate with them. So if you're talking to, for example, a conservative leaning elected official and you use the word equity or inequity, um, they may not like that. Um, but if you talk about uh, you know, the digital divide or what the lack of internet access means for small businesses or, you know, the, how, it, how it impacts the ability of people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that might resonate with them. So, uh, you know, I think it's most important not to get hung up on the words, but just focus on selling your message, um, getting the support that you need to ultimately do the work of digital inclusion, regardless of whatever you call it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we are, it's already three. We have just one minute. But I, I just uh, say thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all our panelists. We really uh, appreciated your time, great presentations, and we are going to share it with not only the um, library professionals for, for library professionals in North America, but globally uh, through IFLA channels, and I'll, I'm, I'm certainly going to use this uh, as part of, uh, I'm going to ask my students to watch this, at least uh, some of them are really interested on digital inclusion and equity issues. This is going to be really useful. I had some other questions. I'll probably send uh, an email to the uh, panelists and sort of uh, this being uh, really making it taking another 10, 10 minutes uh, and recording it. I don't want to do that. Thank you once again. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we will be sharing this video with uh, with you too. And we'd also ask you to share this video with your professional networks and uh, your uh, library patrons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Yes, bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.